we can take heart in knowing that God is walking with us through these days. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, says Isaiah 41.10. Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. As I stand here in our empty sanctuary, I'm reminded of the scripture that we sent out on Wednesday afternoon that said, you are living stones. You see, our sanctuary is beautiful, but church isn't really here today. It's there, out where you are. You know, I don't really think that God caused all of this, but I do think that God has a way of showing up when life gets real. So I wonder, what if in this moment amidst the chaos of COVID-19, what if God is calling us to be the church outside of these walls? What might happen as we name and claim ordinary spaces as holy? What could come of taking ancient sacred practices of worship and putting them right in the middle of our homes? As we worship together in new ways, practicing responsible social distancing, I trust that we will find new and creative ways to love one another well. I hope that you will take a moment and take a picture of your home communion table and share it both in the comment section of our live stream if you're on Facebook and on your own social media feeds with the hashtag open table. You know, today we aren't really in our Sunday best. Instead, many of us come to worship tired or unsure, maybe worried or a little disoriented, maybe even in our PJs instead of our church clothes. But nonetheless, we are here. And maybe that's all God asks of us in this moment. If you are here, that is good enough. You know, I've had a pit in my stomach this week imagining standing in the sanctuary without each of you here with me. But when I woke up this morning, God said, fear not. The church is not a building. It is the people who love God. And I pray that because we have gathered here today, not only will we know that we are beloved in God's sight, but we will remember that our neighbors are too. Do not fear. God is with us. Let us worship God together.
Indeed, come, Lord Jesus, come. I am going to list our prayer concerns, and I also invite you to list your prayers, the deepest prayers of your hearts, into the comment section if you're on Facebook Live. But I do want to remind us, as we're learning how to worship in this new way together, that this service is currently online and will remain online it is public and anyone will be able to see it. So keep that in mind as you post your prayers today. This morning, um, we lift up Irene Love, who fell last week and broke several ribs. She is back home, but we prayed for her continued healing and recovery. This morning, we also lift up essential workers who are going to continue to go to work, taking personal risks, to protect and serve their neighbors. We also remember today the most vulnerable among us, and we pray for those who are experiencing food insecurity and for our neighbors who are homeless. We pray for those who have weakened immune systems and for those who are sick. This morning, we lift up anyone who feels afraid. Good morning, church. While we prepare to pray, let's remember that while we are not physically together this morning, that we are together in our life for Jesus Christ. Let's envision the many faces of our church family and mentally just scan the sanctuary. Let's enjoy a moment of silence and try to clear our minds of the noise that prevents us from feeling God's presence. Now let's bow our heads, take a deep breath, and feel the calming comfort of God's grace. Gracious God, thank you for this day, this community of friends, and this simple moment of tranquility. As we come to you today, let us feel your love, and let us feel the love that we share for one another. God, we are here with heads bowed for many reasons. Some need the comfort that you provide when we are in pain. Others seek courage to tackle life's challenges. We need understanding when our lives are filled with confusion. And God, we need your forgiveness when we fail to live up to the way that you taught us. God, this morning that we ask that each day you move us to celebrate your everlasting love, that you remind us to sing hallelujah even when things seem to go away. And that you provide us the peace and the hope that we so desperately need. God, in this crazy, mixed up in a world, in this frightful time, help us to find all the good that surrounds us. Give us the courage and energy to be your hands and feet. Inspire us to boldly love one another laugh at our imperfect selves, and find true joy in our friendships. Help us to live our faith in good deeds. In these things we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. I have two things that I'd like to say before I read our scripture this morning. 
First of all, I want to remind us how lucky we are to have Megan as our fearless leader. She has been working nonstop to make this all possible and we must not forget that. I also wanna thank Stephen for working on all the technical aspects of this morning's worships. Um, and I wanna thank you all for being flexible and coming and joining us. And second, this is really awesome. <laughs> it's a little strange and uh, it feels a little weird, but I, I think it's really cool. So I'm excited to see how this all works out and how we feel about it um, over the next week. All right, our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 15. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gives us the well and who and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. This is the word of the Lord and in it we can trust. I went to Kroger on Tuesday to stock up on groceries as suggested by everyone in case Chris and I were stuck at home for an extended period of time. Most of you did the same, or at least most of Bowling Green did the same because it looked like the day before a snowstorm or a zombie apocalypse. Chris told me before I ventured to the crowded aisles that there wasn't gonna be any food left. I calmly said, there isn't going to be any normal food left. I'm just saying, it's good to have food allergies in times such as these. <laughs> but I was surprised by the number of people in the store and the scene before me. Bare shelves, no toilet paper, no bottled water. Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. Living water. Jesus offers the Samaritan woman living water. A spring of water gushing up to eternal life. How do I preach about living water when there are so many people in our own community and around the world afraid of getting sick. When places like Italy have to pick and choose who to save. When our friends are stuck in foreign countries and schools are closed. Like the Samaritan woman, do I even know what living water looks like? Would I recognize it if it were right in front of me or would I just see regular drinking water. The image of life-giving water found in our story comes from Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. The prophet Ezekiel sees a river flowing from the new temple, starting as a trickle from the sanctuary, running out of the temple and becoming a great river. The prophet tells us that where the river flows, everything will live. 
One day, an eight-year-old girl came home from school feeling ill. She was offered something to eat and drink, but she said her tummy was upset and she was tired. So her mother tucked a quilt around her and let her sleep. After a while, she went back to see how her daughter was doing and realized something was just not right. She was flushed and hot, but her skin was dry. Her eyes looked glassy and she could hardly lift her head. Her pulse was racing. She called her husband and told him that they needed to get their daughter to the doctor right away. He picked her up and held her as they drove to the nearest emergency room. When they arrived, the nurse quickly took the girl's vital signs. Suddenly, people were scurrying around, running to get an IV stand, asking them to sign permission forms to administer medication. The doctor issued clip commands as he slipped the needle in the daughter's arm, then turned the valve on the line leading from the bag suspended on the metal pole beside her bed. Her parents watched as the fluid poured into their daughter's small body. Within just a few minutes, her eyes regained their sparkle, her skin became less flushed, her breathing eased, and as they watched the monitors, her heartbeat began to slow down. The transformation was astonishing. The doctor explained that their daughter was suffering from dehydration, but we offered her something to drink and she said she wasn't thirsty, the mother replied. At a certain point, a dehydrated person may not feel thirsty. Other symptoms take over like headache, fatigue, nausea, increased heart rate and respiration. But when the body chemistry gets out of whack, it can quickly become very serious. Without treatment, a patient may die. She looked back at her daughter lying on the gurney, laughing and talking with the nurse. She was a completely different child from the one they had brought in just an hour earlier, all because she had received the fluids she lacked. The story of the Samaritan woman at the well teaches us that God does not desire any human being to shrivel and die from a broken body or a parched soul. Rather, God longs to quench our deepest needs and desires with the living water of God's spirit. Some of us come to worship this morning feeling hydrated our buckets full of living water, but others come suffering from dehydration and there is not water left to quench their thirst. Other symptoms like panic, anxiety and confusion start to take over. You may not even want the one thing you need the most, living water. But that's why we're here today, right? Even in the middle of the chaos and the craziness, there is still living water to be found if we know where to look. So where do we find living water in the midst of a pandemic? In the First Christian Church food bank that continues to serve its neighbors struggling with food insecurity. In the school administrators and teachers offering meals to student, students while at home, because of high free and reduced lunch rates in Bowling Green. And the First Christian Church elders making calls, writing cards and delivering food to the homes of our most vulnerable church members. And the folks going to the Humane Society to adopt a pet, to keep them company during this time of isolation. And the families gathered around their tables at home, ready to share communion as a community that is not physically present with one another, but that is spiritually connected. Let us drink it up. Together, we can be the living water that our world so desperately needs right now. If you have an example of living water that you've experienced lately, feel free to share it in the comments section. 
As you know, this Lenten season, we have been talking about spiritual practices. And what better time than now when we're stuck at home to start a new routine. Two weeks ago, you were encouraged to make time for prayer. How many days a week and for how long? Last week, Megan talked about choosing a space, an important place to you where you could spend time in prayer. Where is your metaphorical well? the place where you find yourself encountering Jesus. She also explained how prayer is not like the easy button. Prayer takes courage, training, and discipline, and it isn't always pretty. So this week's spiritual practice is to write a letter to God, whatever that looks like for you. You could journal within the time and in the place you set aside, Personally, I like to color my prayers in letters to God. Maybe some of you could sing it out through a song that has just the right words. Or some of you could go into nature and talk to the trees. But do so in the midst of vulnerability, fear, confusion, and frustration. Because this morning, that's the reality we're all living in but also pray with the confidence that God is listening, that God meets us where we are, and knowing that living water is offered to anyone who will receive it, no matter your gender, economic status, marital status, religious affiliation, sexual identity, age, education level, etc., cetera, et cetera. Yes, right now the world feels like it's shutting down and scarcity is ruling the day. But Jesus is still at the well, just waiting for us to show up with our buckets. And once they're full, we'll never be thirsty again. Amen. Reverend David Shirey, Senior Minister of Central Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky, was interviewed on Thursday morning by a local news station. <clears throat> this was on the heels of our governor's request to call off church, and many churches had not yet decided whether or not to cancel. Pastor David quoted St. Augustine, and he said the question that their church leadership had to ask was, what does love require of us in this moment? Their answer was that love requires us to protect our most vulnerable members who may show up if we had our doors open on Sunday morning. You know, as we come to the table each week, we ask, what does love require of us. And in a week such as this, we are especially mindful that if the table isn't open and set for everyone, then it isn't really Christ's table. It's just dinner. Every week, we practice an open table where we say to everyone, you are loved. You are welcome. You are beloved and created in the image of God. And today we will practice that open table like any other, except that just maybe the table gets expanded a little bit today as people can be invited to the table as simply as touching a button. Now I've heard that many of our grocery store shelves are sitting empty, although I'm sure they're being replenished. But I have a feeling the reason that it's so hectic at the grocery store is because when times are uncertain, we tend to focus on the table. So how many of you have stocked up on the ingredients of your favorite meal? 
if we are going to be at home for a while, if we are feeling anxious or afraid, we often turn to the comfort of our favorite food. So I wonder if this is why Jesus chose breaking bread as one of his final acts with the disciples. Surely on that night, they sat with pits in their stomachs, afraid that it might get worse before it gets better. The disciples had already shown how scared they really were by their bad behavior. Competing for the best position, betraying Jesus for just a few dimes, and soon would even deny Jesus altogether. When we feel afraid, we can be guilty of acting out in ways that are contrary to our faith, hoarding resources, lashing out on the people we love, but I know no one at First Christian has done that. Living in fear instead of faith, attacking our enemies and blaming them instead of loving them. Man, I hate that commandment, love your enemies. But even in the midst of all of that acting out, Jesus took bread, which was really just an ordinary thing after all, and he blessed it and he called it holy. And he took the cup and he said, when you do this, remember the new promise. Remember me and remember who you are. On that night when Jesus gathered with his disciples who were his closest friends, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new promise. Do this every time you drink of it in remembrance of me. And now friends, as you are sitting at your own tables, we remember that we may be many in our tables, in our homes, in our logging in, in our views, but in this moment, we are one. And so I invite you to repeat after me. This is the bread of life. And this is the cup of God's love for you. And this, this is, the is the cup of God's love for you. And all are welcome at Christ's table. All and all are welcome, are welcome at Christ's table. Christ's table. Let us pray together. God, we come to you today not as individuals, but as your living breathing body of Christ. Renew your church today, O oh God, and remind us that there are those who need to know that they are welcome and beloved in your sight. May not just our sanctuary be a place of welcome and unconditional love, but may our homes be places of welcome and unconditional love. We thank you, God, for this bread and for this cup that remind us of who you are and who you are calling us to be. Amen. I now invite you to serve one another. I'm gonna invite Hardin to play a little music. Um, and I encourage you to say the name of the person as you serve them and say, this is the bread of life and the cup of God's love for you. Thank 
takes um we have these little single serve communion cups and i have no idea how to get them open so um i'll have communion later but hopefully you have more success with your communion at home um, as we leave this virtual space today i have a few announcements and opportunities for you to serve um, i just want to keep you up to date with what's going on in the life of the church in this moment Kyle and I are keeping in touch with our community partners like Hotel Inc. and the Housing Authority and even um, contacts in the local school system to find out um, where help is needed and make sure that our community is continuing to be served at this time. And we will let you know as opportunities arise and feel free to reach out to Kyle and I if you know of things that you want the church to plug into. We, like Kyle said, are continuing to offer our food bank and we encourage you to bring food and drop it off um, as a donation for our food bank um, during our food bank hours, which are Mondays and Tuesdays from 10 until 12 and Thursdays from one until three. There are <clears throat> a few volunteer slots that are gonna keep that food bank up and running. And so let us know if you'd like to volunteer there. Um, also this week, we plan to meet with our small group leaders and our Sunday school teachers um, to talk about our new Zoom account. Some of you are on it now, which will allow us to stay connected even as we aren't together um, physically. And our Lamplighters planning team is having a meeting to brainstorm, a meeting by phone, of course, to brainstorm how we can continue to encourage our members who maybe aren't as tech savvy and aren't able to join us for worship online. I think what I'm most excited about this week, and I hope you'll hold it in prayer, is that we are having an IT meeting to talk about how we can improve the quality of our video. Um, and so um, in the case that we end up having cancellations for an extended period of time, we're thinking about how we're gonna continue to get the good news out in ways that are really inviting and make people excited to show up for worship. Uh, friends, the church is continuing to be the church in all kinds of ways. You have called and texted and emailed to see how you can help your neighbors. And I just want to thank you for that. So for those of you who are able to continue to give to the church, I want to encourage you to do so in the link that is listed in the comment section or by mailing a check to the church. These are uncertain times, but I promise you that our church is not going to simply survive this storm, but we are going to be the hands and feet of Christ right in the middle of it. So I hope that you will prayerfully consider your gifts to the church at this time. Will you rise for our benediction? We can take heart in knowing that God is walking with us through these days. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Go in peace, church.